Well, might as well call this a snippet anyway, or at least the last one anyway. It's 5.19 p.m. continuation. It's still the 27th of September, 2023, the Weaver, Giant City, Roseman, California. And unfortunately, I have to keep saying this, and it makes me nauseous every time I do this. Leader, I can call him that, of the House of Carnage. No longer the House of Representatives, the Carnage. Because we've got the circus in town, a two-ring circus in Congress. One of them happens to deal with the, um, <laughs> what used to be called the House of Representatives with a lot of fondness. Now we call it the joke of the uh, government system. <laughs> Only because they've allowed, the controlling parties have allowed insanity to reign supreme. And the leader of the Lunacy Party, or the Truplicants, happens to represent Kern County, California. I hope it puts us into a worst case scenario. I hope we get the brunt of the people's jokes. I hope we get humiliated a great deal because we ought to be humiliated. We are dealing with Truplicants. Who don't care. They want to see. They want to seed chaos and confusion. They want. I don't know what the hell their major malfunction is. I mean, they're worse than spoiled brats and toddler brains. I swear to God. I swear on that one too. They don't care about people. They only care about themselves and chaos and confusion. It's not what the uh, media is saying. It's what their actions and their words are saying. When you have their spiritual leader who is being indicted left and right and they think he's God, apparently. They're willing to lay their lives on an altar to sacrifice their lives for the bastard. They're going to do that on January 6th. And they're still trying to do it because some of them are not quite sure if they want to deal with them or not or just deal with their own head. <laughs> Can they deal with their own heads? I don't think they got heads. I don't know what the hell they got anymore. I don't think they're human. Egotistical, narcissistic, megalomanious. You have a senator out there who thinks, I'm so cool because I come from Alabama. I represent Bama even though I do live in Florida. But hardly know, anybody knows about that one. And I don't care though. I'm just so cool, I can do anything I want, including disrupt lives and say bad things about people. We got a problem concerned about the military being so woke and so diverse. I mean, we're supposed to have the proper military. Now, what the hell's wrong with that? All different people, my. How are we supposed to deal with that one? Hell, how the hell are we supposed to deal with that one? You know, the country a long time ago was conceived of differences. We had different people. They weren't all the quote-unquote same. We had civil war. It was against Union and, and the uh, Confederates. Values. People. Ideas. Ideologies. Not concerning about territory. We already had the territory. I know. It's the ideologues. It's the ideology. I don't get it. Apparently MSNBC right now is wasting air, but firing back at the Trumplicants one way or another. One judge who is supposed to be trying Trump in court received a motion to be uh, to recuse herself, and she said basically no. But we got these grounds over here," said the defense, and she said basically.
it seems they're getting worse and worse every election cycle. The Tea Party, if I remember, started in the late 90s and continued on building the support. They didn't like the things going on. They didn't like how successful the Democrats, I guess, or how weak the Republicans, I think. I don't know. And they were holding things up. They had a small caucus in Congress, and they were just basically telling people, you can't, we can, you will like it, tough shit. They put it bluntly. And it gets to me. They want to show themselves to be family value. They kept producing that one back in the 80s and 90s. And they came up with the spoiled brats. And they expanded upon the uh, spoiled brats. Including through the Senate as well. It's no wonder people don't trust Congress. It's because we do allow people going into Congress and Senate. Because we elected them. We bought and drank the Kool-Aid, and therefore they're there. I'm saying that democracy works when it works. And sometimes we don't like the results of it. But we can't knock it out. We can't knock it off because it is part of our American government. It is us. We're the people, right? Right. And we have to make the choice whether or not we trust this this bastard who comes up to us or a twit and saying that they know better and you can trust them or whatever kind of con job they're going to sell you. I'm not saying that we don't trust democracy. We have to trust our instincts in ourselves. We have to trust our guts. We have to believe that these people know what the hell they're doing. But we also have to put them up an accountability here. We have to make them accountable. We have to make them responsible to the people. Because we're the one empowering them to help make the decisions necessary to make the laws that we can all agree to live under. Constitution and a democracy is the thing that makes our country. And here's the thing we deal with it. We deal with it. That's how we deal we, we deal with it. But we're not. We're fighting each other left and right. We're blaming each other left and right because the difference is and I I didn't make this clear enough because I was watching commercials and still waiting for the news to get on. Our country is made of differences. We're a great American melting pot, they called us a long time ago. Of course, we were called invaders at the time as well when we started off. And we're still called crazy and we're the generation who stole the land from the Native Americans here. And we were. We are. We want to make this work. We have to make it work, otherwise not. I'm going to turn on MSNBC. I'm going to let you listen, okay? I'm going to turn it up. They're talking about the fraud and about the collapse of the empire of the Trump. I won't put this... Decision. There are still a ton of open questions 
about what this really actually means for the Trump organization. Several of Trump's businesses could be dissolved. Their assets could be liquidated. We're, we don't know for sure. The question now remains, has the Trump organization finally been caught after what appear to be decades of evading the law? What happens to businesses now? David K. Johnson is a Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative journalist who has reported on Trump for many years. He's the best-selling author of The Big Cheat, How Donald Trump Fleeced America and Enriched Himself and His Family, and he joins me now. Um, we should say, first off the bat, that he probably will appeal, and that will be, this will be stayed. So there's going to be a little bit of time, I suspect, before they, they, they get this receivership. But let's just start with, like, at a granular level, the dissolution of the certificates and the receiver. What does that mean? Well, in New York State, you can operate a business as a sole proprietor. I write books and articles for a living. Uh, but if I wanted to incorporate myself, I would have to get permission from the state in the form of a business license. In New York, we call it a certificate. And Donald Trump's Trump organization is a corporation set up under New York law and only able to operate with the uh, permission of the state. The judge's order says that all certificates are canceled. You can't operate the businesses. Now, this doesn't mean that they'll, they won't continue to operate. Uh, someone will continue to clean offices at Trump Tower and, and uh, act as a doorman. Uh, but this will be monitored by Judge Barbara Jones, and the judge will eventually appoint a receiver whose job will be to liquidate these assets and the person who will get paid last will be Donald Trump. So this was Reuters reporting about what liquidation means and dissolution, right, dissolve. New York dissolution. judge who found, d found Donald Trump liable for fraud on Wednesday stopped short of addressing whether his scathing decision would force Trump to sell his prized real estate. Trump's businesses own physical assets like Trump Tower, 40 Wall Street. Is the court under the impression those assets are to be sold, or are they just be managed under the monitor? Trump attorney Christopher Kais asked. I'm not prepared to issue a ruling right now, the judge responded. It does seem like there's a big difference between those two, right? Well, the judge isn't going to take a position on this until the trial, which is over how much in damages is owed. Right. This was an effort by lawyers to get the judge to make a legal error, uh, and he's wise to these guys and not going to do that. Um, it is, I suppose, theoretically possible that the court could say Mr. Trump is a passive investor and someone else will run these assets, but where would the money come for whatever penalties are due to the state for all of these frauds? And Letitia James is seeking a quarter of a billion dollars. Uh, Trump doesn't have that kind of money. Right, so what's, what's teed up here, as I understand it is, she's seeking a quarter of a billion dollars. Um, one of these uh, seven uh, complaints was, was found in favor of, of, the, of, of the plaintiff and Letitia James. Six more will be tried, and then there will be a finding of, of the, the, the fee, the penalty for the fraud. And basically what's teed up is the LLC goes into a receiver, the receiver auctions off or sells parts of it to dissolve it to pay the money that is owed the state. Correct. And, and that's essentially what you see happen in a bankruptcy, bankruptcy liquidation right. as well. If this doesn't operate under bankruptcy law, which is federal. It'll be under state business law. But the, the basic concept is exactly correct there, Chris. And uh, the word all, I think, is very important. Uh, if Trump is a fraudster, you can't say, well, you can operate uh, your golf course, but you can't operate uh, another building. Uh, you're not allowed to have a business license at all in New York, nor your two sons or a couple of other people who are named in the litigation. And uh, this is going to take time to play out. This is If somebody thinks that uh, Trump Tower is going up for sale in the auction block next week, no, no. Right, right. Uh, this will weigh out over time, and there will be lots of arguments by Trump's lawyers about each step of the proceedings. You said this in, in the piece you wrote on this. You said, the fact is that Trump's bizarre fact-free and frivolous arguments may enthrall those who see him as their hero or savior. But in a court of law, all Trump could present was distortions, lies, and childish nonsense. And I saw someone today, Benji Sarlin, he used to be a colleague of mine here, he's now at Semaphore, say something along the lines of, once again, Trump's shtick does not survive first contact with a court of law. And you see this over and over and over again. Once you walk into a court where you have evidence and findings of fact, it just doesn't work. <coughs> 
well. And one of the surprising parts of this, Chris, is that so many lawyers are willing to ruin their reputations and risk being disbarred, like Rudy Giuliani, Sidney Powell, Lynn Wood, um, and John Eastman. Uh, on behalf of Trump, uh, when a judge, as this one does, calls a lawyer's argument frivolous, he's essentially saying, you're not an officer of the court presenting a learned argument, you're a drunk in a bar. Uh, he also, in this case, fined five Trump lawyers $7,500 each for yeah. their misconduct. It's really, yeah, it's wild how often this happens, case after case and lawyer after lawyer. David K. Johnson, thanks so much for sharing your expertise, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Still to come, Trump, the front runner, front runner, is terrified of debating. So what or who is the quadruply indicted ex-president trying to avoid? That's next. <coughs> Okay, so now we just talked about Trump's business that he's going to be in trouble with. That was Chris Hayes on MSNBC. And he was talking to an author who has been covering Trump for a long time. Trump has always been known as a windbag. He's always been a storyteller of sorts. He lived in a life of con. Basically, as I understood the stories, started with his grandfather, or maybe a little bit earlier than that, back in Germany. And somehow, Germany couldn't deal with him, so they evicted him. Came to America, according to the stories I've heard. And they landed in New York. An opportunity to exploit the living crap out of people left and right. And they did. It's running down from generation to generation. Trump has grandchildren who are the future generation of con artists. He's got Trump Sr., the one surviving, and not Trump's old man or grandfather. They have been passed on for decades. But no, the current old windbag who made 40, uh, 45th president and destroyed the office basically and the reputation of the government. No, that asshole I'm talking about. His progeny are basically rotten apples. <laughs> Eric and Trump Jr. And then you've got Ivanka. <clears throat> she's trying but she's still part of the tree. And then there's the grandchildren. And they're also modeled under Trump. And they probably will be spoiled for the rest of their lives. Unless, of course, the empire falls and collapses on themselves and they got to scramble. Of course, they've been bullshitting their life like crazy and expecting people to buy the grift. And they're still going to be doing the grift. Ivanka has been trying to, or actually, Ivana or Ivanka, I can't tell the difference between these two. I mean, physically, yeah, but they're still Trumps. So I think it's Ivanka, the daughter. And she's already bought the story hook, line, and sucker. She was trying to make a life for herself, and it's not doing so well. Or else she's trying to make millions at this point, grifting on people left and right with a product line. Donald Trump Jr. and Eric Jr. are still bullshitting their way on the conservative talk shows and everything else that they can find. Still trying to gather and build up their base of grift. But the chief architect for their generation... Well, he's getting himself in trouble with the law. More than what he tried to avoid a long time ago. And he's going to try every dirty trick like a damn mobster to make sure he stays on top. On the top of a garbage heap anyway. Hopefully, if or when the, the judge in New York decides 
that the Empire needs to be dissolved, at least in New York. He, unfortunately, the Trump assets are still out there beyond the state of New York. It's going to be up to the other states to decide whether or not he's going to keep his crumbling empire. So, we are dealing with what we're dealing with. Uh, gross me out. So, what do you think about that one? Trump tried to show himself up as a people, people, uh, people person. He's a man of the people. He's going to be in front of the government because he's going to protect people from the vile criminals of the Department of Justice who are out to get people left and right. <laughs> Some of the people keep thinking that the Department of Justice is nothing but a uh, KGB. KGB. KGB who went out and looked for spies and looked for dissidents who attacked people left and right. Who caged up people left and right for no damn reason. We're supposed to be a country of laws. We're supposed to have due process. And we're still trying to get it right. We ain't perfect on it. There's no way in hell we're perfect on it, damn thing. But we have to keep working on it, don't we? You've got one candidate in tonight's debate who wants to shut down the federal government in a way of slashing jobs, which equals slashing votes. I never thought about that one. He wants to eliminate most of the government system. He's eliminating most of the government workers over there who actually cast a ballot. Not very politically smart. The guy's not politically smart. He claims he's smart and intelligent. He's a fast-talking grifter. He may have a degree in biochemistry or something like that. I'm talking about Vivek, Vig uh, what's his face? 
No, I don't get respect. I don't get respect from the guy. I don't want respect from the guy. I don't want to know the guy. All I know is I see a grifter mouthing off left and right. Yeah, I hear him flapping his lips, but there's no substance in it. <laughs> Especially when he's going to be attacking people and jobs left and right because he can't deal with it. Warner baby. He decides now he wants to go into politics. Held no office, held no job. Nikki Haley, who had been into politics, who held political jobs, who has a little bit more about political savvy, and yet she can't get her ass to go, ass going. And then you got Ron Sanctimonious, the theoretical governor of Florida, except he's the little uh, little representative that looks almost like the asshole out in Nazi Germany. He's running his state the same damn way. Or is he Mussolini in, in, being short? Can't be Emperor Hirohito. All crazy people back in the, in the 30s and 40s. But this is who we have. And we have a few more. Rick Scott. Another grifter. He's just as bad as Larry Elder. Didn't know his ass from a hot rock. And he still wants to destroy the government one way or another. They're all racist. They're all bigoted. One way or another. Seems to me... We're getting worse and worse on this one. I may or may not have to choke down my vomit by watching them tonight. Looks like I've got no choice tonight. I'm going to catch the last of Chris Hayes on here. Uh, it's going past the commercials right now as it is, but I just want to get this. I just want to get it done. <laughs> Probably later than he should. He was widely considered the top challenger as Trump, and I think he had a pretty clear path to at least being competitive, right? To really making it a race. All he had to do, all really anyone would have to do to take on the president, is to consolidate what you might call the normal Republican vote, to bring together into one coalition all of the anti Trump and Trump fatigued Republicans and conservatives. Now, there are a lot of these people, they may not be a majority of the party. But these folks, for instance, chose conservative, real conservative Republican candidates last year, like Governor Brian Kemp of Georgia, while rejecting MAGA candidates like Herschel Walker for Senate in the same state on the same election. But that's not what DeSantis did. In, instead, he went in the opposite direction, right? He was going to, like, beat Trump to his right. He leaned into some of the most extreme, divisive positions, railing against vaccines, obsessing over trans children, going to war against Disney. And clearly it was the wrong call. It's not working. He has fallen as low as 12% in recent polls, nearly 40 points behind Trump. Now, to be fair, to DeSantis, none of the other candidates have succeeded in consolidating support against Trump either. But some at least have actually tried, like Nikki Haley, who is attempting to carve out a more, quote-unquote, again, normal lane without being too critical of the experts. So as the candidates excluding Trump take the debate stage tonight, can Haley successfully walk that line, or can anyone actually put together something like the Brian Kemp Coalition nationwide. Susan Del Percio is a veteran Republican strategist. Simone Sanders Townsend served as senior advisor for Biden 2020 campaign. She is, of course, the host of Simone on MSNBC and Peacock, and they both join me now. Great to have you here. Nice to see you in person. Uh, I think that, let's well, start with DeSantis. It was, I think it was just a fundamental miscalculation of what his path was. He, he had to go for the people who, like, voted for Trump, but they're, like, enough with this guy or, like, didn't like January 6th. But they like conservative Republicans. They don't like Democrats. And it seems to me like there were votes to get there, but he just went the opposite direction. What do you think? Well, I think he came in way too late. And we have to remember, Trump was most vulnerable December, January, yeah. February. That was the time to, to take make that a case, shot. Yeah. Because if you were going to be the alternative Trump to Trump, you know what you need? You need Trump not to be in the race. <laughs> you need to take him out early. And they never did, except for Chris Christie. 
and at that time he wasn't even seriously considering a run or no one knew that he was. They, no one did anything. They just kind of said, okay, he's going to fall apart on his own. We all want to get his base and try what we can. Right. DeSantis basically panics, right, and says, oh, my, he's still here, and now he's getting stronger, so what am I going to do? What you said, Chris, I'm going to go to the right. And the minute he started to do that, his numbers started to fail. Let's not forget, when he passed that six-week abortion, his, uh, his numbers with independent women from Florida is 61 disapproval. Wow. 61, and that was right in Right now, March. independent women in Florida. That was in March, and that was, it only gets worse. And that was after winning an election by 19 points. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I will just say, you know, the reason that Ron DeSantis or anyone else can't be can't replicate what Brian Kemp has been able to do or hasn't even attempted to replicate it because they have not been willing to do what Brian Kemp was willing to do. Brian Kemp was willing to stand against Trump when it came to the Constitution and democracy, to put country over party, to say wrong is wrong, right is right, I'm not going along with the crazy. And Ron DeSantis nor anyone else has been willing to do that. Heck, the 15-week abortion ban, Ron DeSantis went to six weeks because he said, oh, too many abortions in Florida, don't want anybody to think I'm for abortions, don't want women to have any choice, give me six. This is, this is the thing about your, your point about Kemp, and I, I want to be clear on what I'm saying about Brian Kemp, whose politics I do not like mm -hmm. and do not share, right? He's a right-wing Republican. He just has a lot. He is just not a pro coup Republican. He's like every. He's everything. He is. Yeah. He is everything you That's want a Republican. Chris, he is a right wing, he but he is anti coup. Yes. And he is anti he Trump. Is, trying to pull off a coup. Mm -hmm. He is a Republican, it, not a Trumpster. He right. does not follow the path of Trump. He right. follows the path of conservative Republican politics. He never bought into Trump was the party. Right. And people say that doesn't exist anymore. And I think they're right to a certain extent, but I do think it's a little overstated as shown by by Kemp's success. Yes, I think it's really race, like, overstated. It doesn't mean that you're going to beat him, but it just seems like the obvious way, if someone's going to beat him, say it was just Haley and Trump, right? We went down to just Haley and Trump. It's just like, there's a lot of like, again, right-wing conservative Republicans who are just like, uh, Trump, really, again? Like, you can at least build from that. Maybe there's 30% of the primary. 35. That's something to do with, but you got to get those people first. And don't yeah. forget, half of the states have open primaries. That means independents right. or non-affiliated voters can go in, and that's and why... And register their distaste for the guy. Exactly. So, and especially like in a state like New Hampshire, where there's not going to be a primary because of the rules or whatever for Biden, really. So the independents who are 38% of voters in New Hampshire, they can all vote in the Republican primary. But here's the thing, none of the can, I mean, look, this is, we've just really laid out what it is, uh, at least Nikki Haley needs to do. I think Ron DeSantis is too far gone. I think he's never been a good national candidate. Uh, he's not a good campaigner. He doesn't enjoy being on the campaign trail. The man looks uncomfortable. But Nikki Haley, maybe. The problem is she, nor anyone else that is viable, save Chris Christie, is not willing to do what Brian Kemp did. And I agree. I don't right, agree with yeah. Brian Kemp. And so because of that, that no one line that you that really have to draw, line, right. they're unwilling to draw the line. Nikki right. Haley will tiptoe like five feet from it, but she's never going to go to it or over it. And because of that, none of these candidates are going to be That's able to take Donald Trump out. And so then, folks like these independents or these moderate or these conservatives, but non-MAGA Republicans, they're going to have a decision to make in the general election. And I listened to Cassidy Hutchinson today with Nicole Wallace. Nicole asked her, was she going to vote for Joe Biden? Because she's not saying, she, she said she doesn't want to vote for Trump. And she was like, I'm not willing to go there yet. It's a lot of Cassidy Hutchinson's out there, there honey. Are. And if you're not in a vote for not Joe Biden in the general election, it's a vote for Donald Trump. Here, I want to. It's a great point, and I want to just put up this polling today because we had this string of polls that, that had showed Trump beating Biden. There's one out today from the Economist YouGov uh, that has Biden up 45 to Donald Trump 40, which to me feels more in line with like plausible than certainly Donald Trump up by 10 point, getting 52 percent of the vote. None of this is predictive. We're 14 months out. Here's the thing, Susan, that I think is weird about the Republican Party and all this sort of resignation, it does seem like you're walking into a trap. Like, again, I get that everyone thinks that, that nothing could actually damage him politically and he's, you know, you know, he's tough on whatever. I do think it's not going to be great to rally around the nominee who becomes a nominee right around the time that possibly a federal jury is handing down a guilty verdict. <laughs> like, I don't think that's going to be very good politically for the guy and then you're locked into it. But here's the problem. This is the issue with public polling. Like, when I work on a fancy morning with some campaign, we use polling to find out who's gettable. Right. These public polls, they set narratives. Right, yes, totally. And that's what's dangerous. So Donald Trump doesn't, to fight him on the electability argument, 
Why would you? He's tied. Exactly. So it that, exactly. Work, which is by Even the though way. I don't think that's what it's going to be the day after he is possibly convicted Agreed, of a federal that, crime. But you can't use that. You can't use no, that. Wait, Donald Trump has been on the ballot in twenty. In in twenty. In twenty, uh, he picked candidates in twenty-two. None of them were successful. Enough. enough. So. One could argue he's so not very Nikki Haley should be making that argument tonight. We'll see Susan Del Percio, Samantha Sanders, Townsend. Great to have you both. Thank you. Thank you. That is all in on this Wednesday night. I will see you back, back here at this very desk for our post debate coverage at 11 p.m. But don't go anywhere. Alex Wagner tonight starts right now. Good evening, Alex. I don't even know. And that's about it.